what you said and stop recording. Yes, I got you covered. All right, so you're good. You can now talk about being better at the older age. I'm not saying a word. Shave early and <laughs> go. No. Uh, we were talking about Brian has birthday coming up. Aging like uh, Tennessee whiskey or something like that. Something like that. Like a good scotch, baby. That's a good scotch. Oh, there we go. All right. So, as I was saying earlier, I spent the weekend with some really, really good people. One in particular. And we had some of these amazing discussions. You Sometimes when you get around to the people that you're close to in, 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 this, in what we're doing here, um, amazing things turn up. Amazing points of view. Things you would never consider. I think it's one of the most valuable things we have is that most of us are open-minded enough to sit down and listen to somebody and really take into consideration. You son of a bitch. This is still recorded, so we're going to keep going. Anyway, it, 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 it made me really think about a lot of things going on. We also watched a movie. Now, there's, there's, there's a movie called Burn Your Maps, and I've referenced it before. It's not particularly well-written. It's a charming little uh, movie about a young man that, that deals with you know, the death of his grandfather and the death of his little sister. She's six months old in short order. So as this child tries to process this, this painful episode of his life, completely void of the tools necessary to do it, he, um, his parents are having a real difficult time processing that themselves. They also do not have the tools necessary to process this much grief in this short of a time. But it begins to tear him apart. The thing is, is that the, uh, the young boy just says, you know, hey, I got something. I'm going to go find it. So he goes to Mongolia and plays with goats and rides horses and, and he visits a shaman. You know, they still got him. They still got a legitimate shaman over there doing what they're supposed to be doing, like they've done for centuries. <clears throat> you can find them in all kinds of indigenous areas of the world. You can find good ones in America, too. But he provided some answers provided some healing for the little boy and provided some healing for the couple, uh, an unexpected source of encouragement uh, for people that are, are dealing with some of these enormous problems that we can't seem to figure out. It's not something we ever talk about in Austin Truth. We, uh, we knuckle down, we keep a stiff upper lip, we keep putting one foot in front of the other and we figure out how to deal with it. Very, very rarely do we talk about how to take the action necessary to develop the tools that we might not have ever picked up in life. I've said it many times that we, our actions and thoughts and the things we've done brought us to a crossroads so radical that we had to change the spiritual foundation of our life. And then in many times, <clears throat> many instances, the only thing we did was give those same kind of ideas of righteous indignation and ego uh, a different name and a new coat of paint and carried on because now there was no guilt. And we continued on in the same manner and wondered why nothing ever really happened. Why nothing has really changed. Well, I can drink with friends now. I can party like a Viking. I can have a cool haircut and a beard and get away with it. <coughs> I can sport tattoos, but nothing really changes. And there's a, there's a saying in, 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 the, in the Alcoholics Anonymous and, and many of the other 12-step programs, nothing changes, nothing changes. <laughs> think about that little boy. Think about the children that we have in our lives. So when you're, when you're dealing with a child, there's a real idea of hope and there's an expectation. Sometimes many of us lose track of the idea that I'm all that child has. You could set a human child out in the woods and expect a good outcome at all. A baby deer, a baby bear, a baby wolf, they got a better chance. They might figure it out. They might make it. Human child has no hope. And we'd lose track as parents of the idea that we're all they have. And sometimes we escape that responsibility purposely because it, it is a gigantic obligation to these kids that look at us with expectation of being able to handle those problems. Let's say one of these children that we all know and love 
comes to a situation in life that they can't find the tool necessary to do it. And the people that they count on the most, well, they don't necessarily have the tools to do it either. They're so wrapped up in themselves. Maybe they're at that point at the end of the relationship where there's no talking to each other. It's nothing but yelling, nothing but anger, nothing but negative energy in the home. And that child needs to find a solution. That child is in a great deal of pain. The child is like a wounded animal, desperately seeking some kind of relief. We see what happens if it goes on too long. They end up in jails, they end up strung out, and all these other things. Where is it in also true where our children might go and find that kind, that source of inspiration, hope, healing that we seem to be so fond of? Is this is something we need to be asking ourselves. If these children we love cannot come into this spirituality that we all follow <clears throat> without our guidance and find what they need, what are we doing? Christian folk can give, there's your Bible, read your Bible, go to Sunday school. All of the big Abrahamic faiths have a way to take care of them. Here, here's, here's what you read, here's what you study, and it's common. There's a shared knowledge there. There's a shared aspect of hope. <laughs> Part of the problem is, is we keep getting caught up in bullshit ideas that distract us from what our primary purpose should always be. And that is understanding that child is all that we have. That's our future. That child needs to be able to, whether daddy's a fuck up or not, be able to go take a look at what he's trying to follow and find an answer. Well, Pick up most of the literature today, and I read through some of it, and some of it I just have to sit right back down because I, <clears throat> I find myself woefully un unimpressed. People that aren't qualified to carry my water bucket are putting shit out there as if they know something. It's full of $5 words and justifications and interesting, useless bits of information to validate and justify the righteous indignation we have with our lot in life. As if we need to write down this 30 minute dissertation of why I've come here, because I really, I really understand history. How far can we take that with our children? We gotta start taking a real long look at that because <laughs> if you look at all the bullshit surrounding this coronavirus nonsense, these seven years in the infantry, when I see field hospitals being put up and then two weeks later being taken down and naval ships deploying and then returning to dock, when I see assets being put here, assets being put here and stand by for a while and then pulling back, folks, that looks like a training operation to me. That could be wrong. Who knows? A lot of people got sick. A lot of people died. Who am I to say? I'm not a fucking doctor. I'm not going to give you the most cautious aspect to do it. But here's what I can point out. If you're sitting there getting butt hurt about whether or not somebody's wearing a mask, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Who cares? Who gives a shit if somebody wears a mask and you don't? You know, wear it the way it had it. Wear the mask. Try to be safe. It won't stop a fart. Probably ain't going to stop that virus, but go ahead and wear it. <laughs> Some people are going to do those kinds of things. And they're going to get righteously indignant. So as we get bent out of shape about these little issues that show up, that, that are all around the entirety of this, of this thing called the coronavirus, um, we're watching this hand over here. There's some shit going on over here. Get me? Y'all understand what I'm saying? It's called a sleight of hand. It's called, it's called a bunch of things. It's also called a lot of horse shit. Um, but we bite into that. Because we need to feel some kind of justification. We need to feel that we're right. We understand. We know what's going on. <clears throat> Even if you do, what can you do with it? We have an interesting discussion about it. But it creates that idea in our mind that we... We must be mad to be important. Well, me being mad doesn't help my eight-year-old little girl deal with what's going on in our home right now. 
me being mad about people wearing masks and the government lying to us. It's another thing too. At this point in the game, we don't have a legitimate, trustworthy source of news to give us any kind of pertinent information that's not been so cooked, so stepped on, like a, like a North Side drug dealer's coke, that we can rely on it. That we have no viable source of information that leaves us in a real interesting position. Do we sit back and accept it? Well, you do have to kind of calculate exactly what you're going to do. Do you go out in the street and protest? I don't know how much good that's really going to do you. Might get you thrown in jail. Might get you shot. Might get you beat up. Might just make you look like an ass. But you've stood up for something. You've done something. Nothing's changed, but you're, you've been recorded as making a difference. You're more right than everybody else. All right, good. We need those kind of people. We need those kind of people in a healthy, functioning society. Those ones that are willing to stand up and voice who and what they are to, so that the government might gauge and take into account the bar barometric pressure of the so-called population. If you look at, and this is what my friend pointed out, she said, this is just like 1930s, the world in the 1930s. Coming out of the, the, the depression, after one world war, <coughs> the Spanish flu, tens of millions of people have died in the span of 20 years. I mean, tens of millions of people just gone. <laughs> and it took a war, everybody's economy sucks. You know what brings an economy out of the doldrums faster than anything? A really good war. A really good war. So if we sit here and use the mental capacity that many of us have, the logical order of thinking, so on and so forth, we begin to anticipate the idea of some kind of war. But let's take a step back. We're at a real crossroads here. We may not necessarily be dealing with the type of war we're used to. We may not be dealing with the massive deployment and buildup that was Desert Shield. We may not have the time to build up for, for any of these operations that we've been engaged in for the past 20 years. What if this war is a different kind of war fought on a different front? So all of us found ourselves in here. All of us found ourselves sitting around these tables, drinking mead, raising the horn, talking about, oh, all this nonsense. Why? Why now? What's that matter? Why, why didn't it happen in the 50s? Why didn't it happen to the turn of the last century when the virile society, why didn't that carry forward? What'd they, what'd they forget? What'd they miss? What are we missing? <coughs> what if we're fighting a war against a government that's willing to pull out every last stop to make sure that the old systems stay in place. And all of a sudden, millions of people begin to buy into pagan ideologies and no longer subscribe to the horseshit narrative we've been sold all of our lives. What should we be getting upset about then? Masks? Stores not being open 24 hours? the lies of the media, I would submit to you that that is sometimes what they call a uh, scouting operation. Now they know who you are. What if the war we're facing is really a war of ourselves and our ability to move forward in this world? The church will feel it as well. We're not going to be alone in this. That great, vast, Christian, silent majority they're going to start paying attention to this too. Preachers are going to start talking about it. African-American preachers are going to start remembering. And they're going to start preaching about it. We have an obligation here <laughs> to maybe look beyond some of the stuff that we're being told is worth being upset about. Who told you it was okay to be mad about somebody wearing a mask? Who said that was valuable? Who said that even needs to be something to be mad about. I could give two shits less what that person does. It's really none of my business. I don't care. 
Oh, I don't want to have to wear one. Don't wear it. But I can't go in that store. Go somewhere else. This is America. There's a lot of stores. Buy it online. Stay, keep your ass at home. Buy it online. <laughs> what are you really getting upset about? We can't prepare ourselves for the next stage of what we're supposed to become if we're still sitting here playing by an old rule book. If nothing changes, nothing changes. We can't begin to become what we're supposed to become if we're sitting here fussing about stuff that in two weeks' time won't matter a bit. What's that going to do? How mad do you think you can get? I saw my great uncle got so mad he had a heart attack and died. Didn't change a damn thing. Nothing changed. This is what we're looking at, folks. So if we're going to sit here and be mad, because it's socially acceptable to be mad, we have to understand that's all we're ever going to be counted as. That individual, well, he's mad. He feels like he's right. He's righteously indignant and He's mad and he's justified in what he says and he's mad. He's just mad. Nobody cares about the person that's mad. Now you're labeled, categorized, and placed, well, not that. We'll put it in this little cubicle and neatly ignored. What happens when an individual stops buying into that nonsense and begins to cultivate within themselves that expression of who they are in a very powerful, positive uh, mindset that really values who they are of themselves. Not because somebody else said it was okay to value me, but because I said it's okay to value me. It's a big shortage of that. See, if I value me, now when I say something, there's gonna be a thought process involved in that that allows what I'm saying to matter to someone else. There'll be some words that I might say that allows my daughter to see it's okay to love herself. It's okay for her to, express who she is, and think about things. And sometimes we got to be that doubting Thomas. Sometimes we got to be questioning everything. But our entire identity, we cannot, at this stage of the game, afford to get caught up in this magnificent, huge, gigantic fucking training operation and then expect us to have any relevance whatsoever. <laughs> There's a lady, friend of mine, and uh, I remember one morning she called me, absolutely hysterical, in tears, crying. She said they shot him. And I was stunned. See, he was an ex-con, had a big record, tattoos all over him, ne'er do well, just a kid looking for a place to fit in, really. He looked a little brown. So the focus people didn't really care. but. In my position, when somebody calls me in a deal of pain, I have an obligation to provide that counseling, that perfect guidance and direction, and that love that makes everything we're doing here worth its fucking weight. And it's an obligation I take real serious. <laughs> I spoke out in public, but she, he got pulled over, and the, the sheriff said that while he was handcuffed, he produced a 38 and shot the deputy in the back and tried to shoot him, but the badge saved his life and the bullet ricocheted off the badge. So they shot him five times in the back on the side of the road. And then to produce the narrative we ought to be thinking about properly, well, it was released that he really wasn't one of these kinds of citizens. It's really okay because he'd been in and out of prison and he, you know, we expect this kind of thing and this is a public safety and, you know, we wanted to get this, you know, he was released a little too quickly. We don't think it's rehabilitation. So they just killed him. Now, many of us have kind of a checkered past too, don't we? We've been in trouble. We've been in skirmishes. We had law, had a little run in with the law every now and again. Might have a police record. It might be about that long. Hell, it might be that long. I don't know. <laughs> If I'm going to sit around and be mad about a mask and start throwing a fit and yelling in the street, what's the first thing you think they're going to say? Well, he's got this huge record and we really don't, he, you know, he's not really one of these citizens that can contribute to the benefit of society. We don't think he really has the kind of understanding necessary to produce 
a result that will benefit the community in which he lives. And the media will put that shit on TV, all three news channels, and it'll be plastered across. And if a cop happens to shoot you, they'll get away with it. Now, is this where our spirituality and our faith is going to go? And I don't care what spirituality you follow. I don't care if you're the best Baptist on Sunday morning. If you have that kind of record and you start making an ass out of yourself, that's exactly what happens. So what game do we really want to play here? What game do we want to play with our future? Do we want to cultivate that kind of righteously indignant rebel without a cause? I'm, you know, I'm tough. I've done this. I've done that. And really get ourselves painted <laughs> as a target uh, and never really get anything done. And it sure as hell isn't helping our children who are scared at this time find out where they might go for some help. Because that's where we are, folks. That's where a bunch of us are. That's where a bunch of the people that I see, that I love, that I care for, that's where they are. They will find the thing that creates the most righteously indignant passion within them and share that amongst their friends so that it can all be righteously indignant and nothing changes if nothing changes. And we're spinning our wheels and we're not producing the content or the art or the beauty or the heritage or the culture our ancestors did that we so highly prize. And yet we expect our children to follow in our footsteps. How are we going to fix that? <sighs> the answer is going to piss everybody off. When we start looking at left and right, we've got to start asking those people, is that really worth it? Does that make you more important than me? Does that make you, you more important than them? Does any of it help our child grow up in a home full of hope and love? Because that's what we got to get. That's where it's got to be. Our children face a world we don't even comprehend. None of the old structures that we trusted in and relied on are valid anymore. Not the news, not the government, not the school systems. You got drag queens in libraries. You got parades in the street for things that are 20 years ago would have had the Department of Human Services at your door taking your kids. Now it's a fucking parade in the street. <laughs> All of that makes me mad. None of it helps me cultivate in myself that kind of understanding that allows me to point my child where to go. This is how you get through this. Now, here's the real thing. If I help my child cultivate that kind of mentality and then understand there's something for you to believe in here. There's something that will help you. We find refuge from our grief and our wisdom. So does it have them all by teaching our children to be righteously indignant about all these wrongs in the world. But there's an awful lot of wisdom in teaching our children that we can rely on each other, this family, and the people that are extended parts of this family, we can rely on each other and build a good, healthy, happy home. Now that's a real terrifying thing for people that want to take control of the narrative and dominate what's going on and really get it fixed because the entirety of their identity comes from just how fucking mad they can get about any given issue. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. You have Rush Limbaugh, you have people on the left, you have sports analysts. Think about what a sports analyst does on TV. <laughs> he, he will tear a player apart and you'll be in there with it. Yeah, he didn't, why well, he wasn't part of MLB, talking about all these things. And these people get just butt hurt about it, man. They will get bent out of shape. Then the other guy over there will make fun of him. We're getting suckered up in that, in things that matter about our real life. It's drawing us away from the attention and the narrative that's so important to our faith. All faiths. And Stan, you hear what I'm saying? All faiths, not just us. All of them. If you look back far enough in the Muslim world and the Islamic world, you find a world full of culture, architecture, beauty, art, all of that. Look how it's degraded as they became more and more obsessed 
with the negative aspects of the Western world and how it's the demon and how it's the how it's be the detriment to the it's all of its hedonistic characteristics and pagan ideologies and they deserve as the more angry they got, the less desirable it looked like to us for them people living in mud huts in the Middle East. Went three, four hundred, five hundred thousand years ago, had beautiful palaces. Art was a water was a part of their architecture that mirrored the columns. It was it's amazing stuff. The more indignant they got about it, the less they were capable of demonstrating the ability to express that beauty. So if we think about it, are we not in that same boat right fucking now? Are we not in the same boat <laughs> with everything in all so true? I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody that, well, I'm folkish. And I'm glad for you. Does that make you better than me? Well, I'm universalist. And does that make you better than me? What do you understand that I don't? Are you does that make you taller? I, it made you taller. I didn't even know. It caught me with that funny joke. <laughs> Who cares what either one of them are doing? If I see people get on there and they'll find somebody practicing Austro, they don't think should be practicing Austro. They'll put a picture up about it and everybody will make fun of them. And all those people will for a little bit feel more justified in how they're acting and how they're behaving and what they think and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and that person they just made fun of couldn't give a fuck less what they did. So, are we not in that same boat of subscribing to these ideas that keep us tied up in knots of righteous indignation and keep our thought process stuck in a spinning pattern that does nothing to move us forward? Because that's a real danger. And if that happens and that continues to happen on an ever greater scale, everything that we hold special about what we found here that saved many of our lives, that turned many of our lives around, that pull us up out of some of the darkest places some people only ever fucking see in a movie. We found something that brought us up, that made us believe in ourselves, that allowed us to stand up. And we get caught in that, it dies in the backyards when the last barbecue's done, when we're done. You get me? So if we're gonna step up and face the warfare of the evolution of the human psyche, which is what we're facing, um, perhaps we should stop subscribing to those lowest common denominators and that low hanging fruit. Let me reach it high in that tree. Climb that son of a gun if you have to. Get up there, pick the best, brightest, greenest, or freshest fruit you can find. Stop picking it up off the ground and acting like you found a treasure. <laughs> I don't want to give my child rotten fruit. There you go, eat that, it'll be good for you. Dad, there's a worm. It's okay. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. I want my children to feast on a wonderful table of abundance, prosperity, success, peace, and the ability to defend all of it when necessary. And it's a fine line to figure out when to do it and when to not. There's a line in the prose editor where it talks about Odin. He's sitting there, hanging out with the guys. One aspect of his face, he's a beautiful, handsome, good-looking chieftain king. You know, he's just what you expect. But to find his other visage during a time of war, he is most terrible to behold. I always loved that. That's exactly right. I'm a laid-back, casual dude, man. It's a good life, and I really enjoy it. I want to teach my kids how to do it. <laughs> I can't afford to get mad about it thing that comes along that the media says I need to be mad about. Now, if they come to my front door, it's a whole nother story. It'll be instantaneous. I don't have any control over it. I'm going to protect my home and my family. We should all be that way. <laughs> we just got to start looking at what we're doing, guys. Because we're, we're setting ourselves up for failure. with The same kind of stuff that brought us down before. I don't want to see that happen. I know too many good, good people that I really give a shit about. And I see them buy into this kind of stuff. And I'm like, man, I really, I really thought they were further along down the road than that. That sucks. My first thought is what do I say to help them set that to the side and 
become something more. And that's what I want. It's the only thing I give a shit about. I ain't gonna get rich selling books. I ain't gonna get rich doing this. I'm just sitting here because I think there's hope for people. I'm sitting here because I think that people deserve an opportunity. Man, if you've made the brave enough jump to change to, to do this and face the ridicule of all the people around you, <clears throat> don't you owe it to yourself to figure out how to make sure that your children have a way to do that and find that in, in, from you, whether you're there or not? I mean, that, most of us, we had to go through the real ringer to figure all this out. We had to take a real kick in the balls. Man, can we not stop buying into that horseshit that's keeping us from developing in our children a positive image of what we're trying to do? Because there's going to be a time of need for our children, whether we love, I like it or not. Struggle builds strength. Right? All pain is the building of strength. It's just the way life is. Parts of it are tougher than hell. Parts of it suck. Parts of it just make you, some people don't make it through some of those times. We owe it to our children to at least create an environment where they might reach out and say, you know, this helped daddy get through something. This helped mama make it through so many tough times. Maybe I'll take a look at it too. My gosh, man, when you boil it down and think about it, that's the most important thing we could ever fucking do. Period. Period. And that's going to take many, that's going to take many forms. Some people are going to find it in a national organization. Some people are going to find it in a regional kindred. Some people are going to find someone special in their world that <laughs> makes them want to be someone better. And that's good. That's what it's supposed to be like. I don't know about you, but this is a lot of times in my life, I found myself in rooms full of people. I didn't feel like being a better person. I felt like the shit on the bottom of somebody's heel, you know, walk out of there. God damn, why not do that? Fuck. <laughs> Today I find myself in a much better place. Today I find myself in rooms full of people that make me want to be a better man, that make me want to be worthy of being able to sit at the table with them, that make me want to be worthy to sit with them, that make me want to stand up and be that example. My children might think that sometime in their life. Damn, daddy made it through. What was he looking at? Oh, yeah, that book he wrote. Ah, so there's my real legacy right there. I will be immortal. My children will look at those books later on in life. After I'm gone, my grandchildren will look at those books. Do something that inspires those future generations to say, yeah, I heard he went through some shit. He made it. Now, if they hear he was raising hell because people were wearing a mask during a virus, <laughs> you know, there's going to be something else coming down the road, period. This whole training operation, there's going to be something worse next year. There'll be something worse the year after that. The war we might be facing, it may not be the regular battlefield we've always fought on. It might be a battle of the spirit. It might be the battle of us standing up to become something worthwhile and creating a safe place for our children. It might be entirely different than anything we could imagine. It might be a very personal one. Hell, the president could be going through it right now. We don't know. He might be having a real moral decision-making problem. He's got to figure it. He may have to grow into it and to make it properly. <laughs> we can only hope billionaires don't need to do that but because they can throw money at it, but we don't. None of us are billionaires. So I think that's the thing that's been on my mind the most. Quit getting tied up in shit that's, that's not going to do anything other than impress someone else that's also mad about it because you read something they have and you guys can talk about it. How about being that individual that, that, that smiles at somebody when they're trying to do something tough in their life and encourages them and helps them step forward and gives them a hand up when they need it, that actually gives a shit, that's willing to take a little bit of their pain and help them sh shoulder that burden as they move forward. <laughs> How about being that kind of individual that has a loving enough home that their children understand it's going to be okay? You know, not, you know, I didn't grow up always knowing that. Many, not, many of us didn't always grow up knowing it was going to be okay. Well, shit, guys, we found this spirituality and this faith. 
um, maybe it's time we try to do that. Because like I say, when we look at our children, we need to realize we're all they've got. We can't count on our government. We can't count on the school. We can't count on anybody. We are all they have to provide that ex example of what it means to have positive purpose, guidance, and direction. And it's in our spirituality. Getting mad about a face mask or finally figuring out that we've been fucking lied to about this entire coronavirus nonsense. <laughs> well, okay. Let's take a step back before we decide to go shooting people in the streets and see if we can figure out how to make sure our children are okay first. Because I got a little girl that means the world to me. I got some other people that mean the world to me too. I don't feel like losing them over something stupid. Period. I appreciate everybody joining me tonight. I'm, I'm about to say 45. It's been a long day for me. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, Brian, real quick, can you send me a link to the group or page that you've got set up for businesses? My wife has decided to start selling uh, jewelry and Avon. That is Melissa. That is Melissa doing that. So I don't, I don't know what it is. I can't tell you. All right. Well, I sent her a message about it the other day, and she never got back to me. And uh, you will. I'll remind her. The business right. page. Yeah, I believe that's it. I was gonna post about it in the uh, in the messenger group, but I didn't know if I, if that was okay. Um, if you need to ask for the link, yeah, that'd be fine. But you know, typically with your with your network marketing kind of stuff, we tend to shy away from that. I mean, if there was any money to be made in it for real, I mean, all of Austria would be selling Avon and Tupperware, <laughs> probably Amway. We would all be Amway millionaires. <laughs> right. I ain't, right. I ain't how to make that multi-level network millionaire status yet? Just ain't gonna work. <laughs> but hey, it's there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's good stuff. But I'd like to keep that kind of. I mean, you ask for the link from her, blow her shit up, man. Send her a dozen messages in thirty minutes. Make her angry. She'll answer that. She's redheaded. <laughs> so, uh, anything else, guys? Hi, Brian. I sent uh, Melissa a reminder to send Lane that link. Send it two or three times. I will. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You bet, ma'am. I hope you're successful with it. I hope you make a ton of money. I hope you'll just knock it out of the damn park. You know, I'm not, I'm not really in it to make a whole lot of money. I just, you know, All right, our so whole thought process on it is... Uh, let her get it. Let her make enough that she can, you know, be able to buy the things that she right, wants. Stop to right there, man. All right, come on, son. If you're presented with an opportunity that gives you an opportunity of unlimited income potential, and you say you put a boundary on it of well, just regular, you are shooting yourself in the foot. Find that goal, shoot for the fucking moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. I saw that in my friends' wall this week. <laughs> it's true as fuck. Go for it, man. Don't half ass it. Don't there ain't no half stepping in this. We're big time, man. Step up, step forward. Give it all you got. I mean, I'm telling you, do it. Yeah. Tell her if, if she if she tries to bow out, you need to get your woman under control, man. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny. If, try to film that for me because I want to see it. <laughs> Yeah, it's easier said than done. <laughs> Buddy, I, I love her to death. I love her to death, though. It's all you can do. It's the only thing you can do. But I, I think it's really important when you're thinking about that. We, 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 do, we do rise up to the level of our thoughts. And if we put a limit on that, that's about all we get. That's about as far as we'll get. Well, I'm only, you know, maybe if I can get five things or if I can make a couple of sales, that's what you'll get. Um, you know, if I can, if I can sell a hundred books this month, well, that's what I'll get without fail. <laughs> so don't limit yourself with your thought process. I mean, really think big. 
Because what you're doing is, is you're training your mind to be aware of the opportunities that will present themselves. It may not look like what you're working on, but if you shoot, if you really do that, if you really begin to cultivate a thought process that, that aims for a very specific goal that's way up here or way out there, that's maybe a little bit out of your reach, your brain will begin to make itself in shape to be aware of the opportunities that arise along that path. It's one of the most important things we can do. What are the opportunities that are gonna come up? How will I capitalize on them? And that shit happens that fast. That fast and you're just, you've missed it. All right, next. So really cultivate that. Really get your mind wrapped around the idea that you're worth a hell of a lot more than you currently think you're worth. Yeah. Some people think that's horseshit. I don't, I've seen too many jackasses with a million dollars. So I think it's probably true. You know, I've seen some real screw ups out there just be bopping around, you know, Hey, I got a million dollars. Now, one thing, in, one very, very, very important part of that is you have to work hard at it. It ain't no nine to five on any of that stuff. Anytime we want to set a goal that's way above and beyond, it ain't nine to five. It's, all right, about 7.30, I got to start winding it down or um, and so I can eat some dinner. And then at 10 o'clock, well, I probably better get in for another couple of hours and get some emails out and get this done. And then four or five hours of sleep. And then you got to get up in the morning uh, before everybody else and start. So when they get into the office, they're seeing your first production before they even got their first cup of coffee. That's how you win. And if you cultivate that thought process of being worth that much, <laughs> You will become worth that much if you put in the work to go hand in hand. Let's start with the thought process. It's the easiest thing to do. It'll, it'll keep you motivated when things ain't going right at all. Are you worth it? Well, I've made it this far in life. I've done pretty well. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm worth it. Okay, then. So just, just do that. I mean, I, I really... That's, 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 the, that's the real deal. There's no work-life balance. You know that right now. Yeah. There's no work-life balance. You want to make some money, you got to get out there and hustle. But you're right. You do have to have something on the side because trading your time for another man's dollars will only ever get you so far. <laughs> you need two or three sources of income. And it could be dividends. It could be, for me, it's books. It's dividends and interest on bonds and stocks. And, and it's a job. So all three of them, sometimes they do better than others. Sometimes there's other things. I get opportunities to show up and allow me to make more money. Um, you just, you stay on it. You stay on it. Um, and sometimes you might have to look at it and say, this is too much sugar for a dime. I ain't doing it anymore. Yeah. So. Anyway, anybody, anybody got anything else? Okay, tomorrow's Monday, guys. Go ahead and grab it by the nose and whip its ass. All right, Brian. Have a good night. I'll take care. We'll see you around. See you, Brian. Good night. Good night. It's good to see you, Milana. <laughs>